Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello and welcome to Focus on Health. I'm your host Peggy Mello. Today's guests are Diane Cameron from Community Caregivers and Carol Ann Tiberia with Senior Whole Health. Welcome to the show ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Diane, why don't we start with you. Um, can you please talk about your organization and what you do for the community? I'd be happy to. Community Caregivers is a nonprofit organization and we do what we call helping hand services mm -hmm. for, for people of all ages but particularly for seniors and that includes things like transportation, shopping, uh, taking someone's shopping list and going to the store for them, any kind of errand. Uh, it also includes teaching people how to use their cell phone, an answering machine, maybe a computer if they have one. We do friendly visits where someone goes in and does a, a social visit or a friendly visit with someone or calls them on the phone on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And we also do respite for caregivers to give caregivers a break in their home. Okay. And what are the service areas that you um, actually provide service? Is it Albany, Al Albany County is included? Our services are, are in different parts of Albany County. So most of the Helping Hand services are in Gilderland, Bethlehem, uh, the Hill Towns, Burn Knox, Westerlow, and the Carmen Road area, New Scotland. And then we have an extensive education program and training programs for caregivers, and that's for all of Albany County. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how does a person get a referral and, and how what are the criteria for referrals? Uh, referrals come from all different kinds of organizations. They come from hospital discharge planners, other nonprofits, organizations that work with specific disabilities or diseases. They come from uh, insurance, health insurance companies like Carol's firm. Um, and they come now also from faith community and a lot of word of mouth, people who know that a neighbor may be struggling and say, you know, do you know about community caregivers? You should give them a call. Okay. Can they self-refer, or is that not permitted? <laughs> yes, in fact, it's, it's, it's very permitted, and, and it's a very effective way of doing it. People call and say, I understand you may be able to help us with this. Here's what I need, or here's what I think my mom or dad needs. So what are the criteria that you somehow decide whether somebody is in need of help or not? I mean, I need my, mo my lawn mowed, but... <laughs> Can I call you to have you do it? Probably not. Well, you, you can call, and it may be because we do help people of all ages. If, for example, you were a caregiver and you were taking care of somebody and you need your lawn mowed, that might be an area where we would find a volunteer to step in. The biggest criteria for us is finding the right person to come and help. All of our services are performed by volunteers, and we have more than 500 volunteers who do all of these services for no charge. Okay, so somebody could ask for a service and nothing's coming out of their pocket That's right. to get that done. That's right? right. Okay, they don't have to tip anybody or anything else. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> okay, Carol Ann, um, let's ask you about your organization. Sure. What do you do for them? Okay, Senior Hall Health, we provide low income seniors with a voluntary health care plan that provides them health care that is put into place so that they can remain at home. And they're independent, they're safe, it's a high quality of life, and it also provides the caregiver a peace of mind. You know, our approach to that candidate that might be a good match for the program looks at not only the member but their family mm -hmm. and their caretakers as well. So it's a very comprehensive, holistic approach that just embraces you know that person and, and what's around them. And it's, it's from what you've told me it seems like it's mm. more of a holistic approach than a generic HMO. Um, there are certain services that, that you would cover 
that a generic HMO would not cover. That's true. You know, we have to function under the same auspices of, of any other um, health managed organization and, you know, are regulated by the same laws and the Department of Health. We have a lot of big brothers and sisters looking over our shoulders so that we make sure that we do all the things, you know, correctly and by the law. Mm -hmm. But because we're an integrated health care plan, and quite frankly, we're the only one of its kind in this part of New York, mm -hmm. we combined Medicare and Medicaid and pharmacy benefit and long-term care services. And, you know, and all of that, when you even think about it, it's very complex. It's very difficult for someone to navigate through the health care system right. who may need all of those benefits. So we're in a position of not only administering all of those benefits, but more than that. You know, when my nurses, anyone that's um, assigned to um, or join senior whole health, they're assigned a nurse care manager and a community resource coordinator. And those two representatives really are attached to that member and their family, and again, to help them navigate through the system so that we can provide all the care that's needed. So it goes beyond you know, having um, a home care benefit or meals on wheels or having transportation to and from their physician's appointments, which is important. Right. But I can stand back and look at anyone who may have a respiratory ailment. And certainly coming into the season of the flu and other um, uh, things that could impact someone's respiratory, you know, condition, mm -hmm. um, we can put other things into place to it, preventative wise. Um, in, in the realm of respiratory illness, you know, this past summer, we were able to put in air conditioners for someone who had chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Right. And that in itself made that person more comfortable in their home. Mm -hmm. It gave them a better quality of life and it kept them out of the hospital. So while the benefit plan didn't reflect air conditions are covered, we were able to put that into the person's home because of the flexibility of our plan that we can allocate the resources where it makes sense. And I think that's a good example of how you, you can, it's a convincing argument of how you are different from any other health maintenance organization that's that right. out there. And plus the fact I cannot imagine me calling my HMO and, and them referring me to a community organization because it seems like the two of them are not ever connecting with each other. It is. It is. It's and, you know that's a great that's a great comment because it's hard to connect the dots um, on anyone who you know may be eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. Again, if you think about it, it's a very vulnerable citizen. If they're eligible for both of those, it's you know the systems in itself right now are fragmented, so it's right. difficult to you know maximize the benefits from each of those organizations and you know to provide the care. Is it a, a separate? I'm sorry, I don't know enough about mm. Medicare and Medicaid to know <clears throat> what the application requirements are. Mm -hmm. Is it a separate uh, paperwork for all of the different things that you've mentioned, like the Part D and, and all of that? And So rather than them having all of the separate things to navigate, they just have one thing that they have that's to worry right. about, That's right? right, yes. And you know, this has been on the table of the policymakers for a long time. Our program actually began in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 2003, and it really came from a cry from the government to say, we need something else besides the, the fragmented Medicare over here and the Medicaid over here to bring those benefits together to administer them back to the member. So it really was from that initiative, and we brought it to New York in 2007, so that you're right. At the end of the day, someone only needs to join, and we could administer that host of benefits back to them. The providers are happier. The member's happy. There's no delay in care. It actually minimizes all of those obstacles. Hmm. Okay, and you do serve Albany County, correct? Albany, Saratoga, Schenectady, Rensselaer, Ulster Duchess, and we are expanding in 2010 just because it has been so successful. Hmm. Okay, and so basically a, a person that could apply for your plan, would they be, would it be the same eligibility requirements for Medicaid? You know, another great question, because sometimes people don't know that they're actually eligible for Medicaid. They must have Medicare and Medicaid, but if someone suspects that they may be eligible, but they just haven't done the legwork or the paperwork, they can call us and we can actually help them secure that. Great. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. Yeah. Okay, so now we talk about caregiving in general. Um, I have a note here that I have, the typical family caregiver is a 46-year-old woman caring for her widowed mother who does not live with her. She's married and employed. 
how does that right. complicate your life? <laughs> right, and, and I'm, I'm reminded when I'm listening to Carol talk about what Senior Whole Health does, that one of the, the values that we share is helping people stay in their home, prevent unnecessary hospitalization, and it's taking care of the rest of the family because you know, in that example, the woman who is employed has kids, has her own career, or making a living in some way, is taking care of someone who is elderly. So there's a lot of stresses on the family. So any place that we can relieve that family stress, whether it's a medical service mm -hmm. or a caregiving service or helping the caregiver to take care of herself or do a better job, we're going to preserve that family. And I think in this economy, we're going to preserve an income as That's well, right. which is very significant. Mm -hmm. Now, what are some of the um, training opportunities that you provide to caregivers? We do a, a, a range of workshops. We give workshops on very specific illnesses and disabilities, on arthritis, you know, what it's all about, what you need to know if you're the person who has it, if you're a caregiver for someone. For Alzheimer's disease, we have support groups for each of those, for the caregivers mm -hmm. in those mm -hmm. situations. And then we do workshops specifically for the caregiver. One that we do is writing for caregivers which is on the surface it's kind of a fun outing people learn about keeping a journal and about using writing techniques but it's they're also taught how to write with the person they're caring for so it becomes a care technique as well aha uh -huh. that sounds very interesting um, I'm wondering you know what does it do what are the, the physical and emotional effects of caregiving? What does that do to a person? It's a, it's a mm -hmm. really important question because I think sometimes we use the word caregiver and it, you know, it has care and it sounds very sweet and very mm -hmm. nice and we're, we admire people. Um, what we often forget is there, there's a tremendous physical cost for a caregiver. One of the very startling statistics is specifically a caregiver for someone with dementia. 40% of the caregivers die before the person they're caring for. A caregiver mm -hmm. who may be um, caring for someone with any other disability or illness, 57% of women who are caregivers develop their own chronic condition. Mm -hmm. Part of that is the stress of caregiving, and part of it is when you're very busy as a caregiver, you put off your own doctor's appointments, dental appointments, you delay exercise, eating well, and so the, the health cost comes to the caregiver. Mm -hmm. Now, who can talk to the, the physical effects of stress? What, what does that do to your body? Well, I think, I think we, we both see that in the, the people we care about. You know, and, and, and we all want to do the right thing. And I think, you know, as we become older, we want to remain independent. It's, it's what society, you know, expects from us so that when we start to encounter the dilemma, um, of not being able to take care of ourselves and then you know that what we call you know the sandwich generation when you know we're, we're trying to stretch that responsibility and taking care of ourselves and or our aging parents or our children that um, it can impact our you know immunization and you know it has everything to do with just keeping yourself healthy and uh, right. you know when we're not able to do that on a on a balance um, then it, you know, it's, it's the adage of if you don't take care of yourself, then you're not going to be, you know, any, any good to the people that you're trying to care for at the same time. Right. And you're probably losing sleep and, and that affects the immune system. Absolutely. Too, right? I mean, we have to throw out a hat though to the, to the men. Um, the men do try to, you know, um, make a, uh, an effort in taking care of, of elders, but um, by and large, the statistics still show, you know, that women do this and, um, you know, on the average, I think from, from what I've read recently, you know, we're giving more than 40 hours a week to the tasks that are attributed to taking care, you know, of our, our aging parents. And remember, it's That's not just crazy. about aging parents, it's about people recovering from disabilities and also people who are, you know, just sick and, and, and need some help with that. Okay, so you've got 40 hours to the full-time job, right? 35, 40 hours. You've got 40 hours to the person you're caregiving That's for. That's right. Yeah. And how many hours for the actual family yeah. that you're trying to take care exactly. of? Right. Your children. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's very. Um, it's a struggle. You know. I'm. I'm reminded. I was. Um, I mean, just being a, a nurse and you know, and a clinician and having worked um, with hands-on nursing and now in managed care organizations, really advocating for the past 15 years um, for people who can't take care of themselves. 
um, I'm, I find myself reading, obviously, articles and in, in, uh, information, you know, that relates to it. And there was a syndicated journalist um, that wrote an article in 1999. Her name was Carol Abea. And she has since become a great advocate and speaker for caregivers. She um, talked about the sandwich generation, and that's mm -hmm. something I think that someone, you know, most people can um, um, relate to now. You know, and it's that person who really is sandwiched between the responsibility of taking care of their parents and their children. She actually likened her own experience of working at a communist camp in Indonesia and found that to be easier mm -hmm. than it was time for her to take care of her own aging parents just because of how difficult it was to navigate and find the help to do that. Um, she went on to coin other phrases, which I found kind of interesting. And it was from the traditional sandwich generation to the club, club sandwich. sandwich. If you heard of that. that. And, you know, it was again about women in their 50s and 60s now taking care of their parents and their children and now their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And then there's the open face sandwich, which again speaks to just the the branches, you know, of this phenomenon that's that's taking hold of all of us. And that really relates to anybody who's taking care of anybody else. So I think, you know, when we talk about caregivers and we take time out to step back and recognize them, I hope that it also perpetuates some thought with our government agencies to do more to support respite care. It, I think, reflects hopefully a, a passion, you know, from our nation that gives recognition to it and helps us showcase what resources are available for those caretakers because I think right. we, we're wrapped up in, you know, the day-to-day -day responsibilities and we don't stop and think about what is out there to help me do this. Mm -hmm. And we, we have some complicating factors in our society nowadays. Number one, people are living longer, right? That's right. <laughs> I mean, that... Whether we like it or not, they right. are. Right. Yep. And is, is it true that people will live longer if they are allowed to stay at home rather than being in a, in a nursing facility? I think that the research does show that, and we know. It's sort of the... It's sort of, um, the secondary gain or cost of improved health care. People are living today with illnesses mm -hmm. and diseases mm -hmm. and conditions they would have died from 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Right. So there's something good to celebrate there, but it also means they're going to live longer. So the caregiving goes on longer right. than it used to a few years ago. And you know, today is the age of uh, information on the internet where there are some seniors out there that are living at home that don't have computers. Right. That might not be able to hear very well on the telephone. That might, you know, have some kind of sight impairment. So how are they going to call? How are they going to read something? Exactly. How are they going to get information off the Internet? Oh, well, the form is online. Well, how am I going to get that? Right. Well, I can advocate for libraries and say they can always call us or come in and visit us. Yeah. But more complicating factors out there. Right, and I think it's, it's one of the pluses of our kinds of organization because each in our own way help people with that, the, the ref reference and advocacy piece. You know, a lot of people will call us. They may not need our direct services, but we can say, you know, here's how you can get some help with air conditioning or your heat right. or um, uh, concerns in your home. You know, and Carol's organization can help people directly in those ways too. Mm -hmm. I mean, at, I can say at the reference desk in the Colony Library, where we are right now, I mean, I've gotten all kinds of referral questions to social agencies, and, you know, there are just some answers I just do not have mm -hmm. in my head. Right. Mm -hmm. The person that was 20 years old that needed knee surgery mm -hmm. and didn't have any money to pay and didn't have health insurance, and honestly, I didn't know what to tell her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's, it's a great point, Peggy, because it's, you know, we have to work together in finding the right vehicles to reach some of the, our most vulnerable citizens. Again, you know, this forum that we're doing, of course, is very important, but it's mm -hmm. those people who are isolated. And that's why, you know, when Diane and I work together, you know, we can get the word out more. Um, we work very closely with physicians' offices, you know, with other community-based organizations. You know, it's, it's very grassroots. Because, again, these people sometimes are at the back of the line. You know, they're not in front yeah. waving their hand saying, you know, I'm the one that needs help. There has to be an extra effort in, in finding them. Right. 
and helping them get to, I think the, the, you're reminding me, you know, we know as professionals there are a lot of services out there and we may have the directories and we can tell people where they are, but our biggest service is transportation. And I often say oh. the services may be out there and they may be free or inexpensive, but if you can't get there, it doesn't help you. Right. So you need that ride, you need that errand done so that you can get the services that are going to improve your health or mm -hmm. let you stay at home mm -hmm. or have a dignified life. Mm -hmm. You know, and the other layer to this is our non-English speaking population. Mm -hmm. You know, and at Senior Home Health, we're proud that, you know, our staff reflects the diversity of our population. But again, you know, we have to consider mm -hmm. that and start getting out. You know, we talk about the correspondence that, uh, you know, it, um, is delivered to someone's home. What if that person is, you know, illiterate and non-English speaking? You know, right. then that's another layer of complicating. And they may need us just as, as much as, you know, someone else. That's certainly true. Um, I definitely have to ask you, Diane, about volunteer opportunities. Are yes. there volunteer opportunities for your organization? Ongoing volunteer opportunities. One of the things, whenever I say we for community caregivers, I'm really speaking about the 500 volunteers. And people generally volunteer for one to, say, four years. So we're constantly recruiting and training and orienting and getting new volunteers started so people can call us to learn about that as well. And it's an ongoing need, right? It's an ongoing <laughs> need. And one of the nice things is families can volunteer together. If parents or one parent would like mm -hmm. to vo volunteer, children can go with them and learn about volunteering, meet older people, and have those kinds of experiences as well. That's fantastic. And we come together on an annual basis to give recognition to the caregivers, and it's yes. really a wonderful event. Yeah. yeah, it's very emotional, you know, too, because people who usually do the caregiving are don't do it for the recognition, you know, or for the feedback. You know, it really comes from a, a special place. Yeah, and uh, but they do. They're the most humble again. people. Yes, they really many are. Times. Yeah. Yeah, and helping a neighbor. They're, they're really lending a neighbor a hand. Yeah. And it gives them a quality of life, too, because it's a lot of our senior citizens right. who end up volunteering for it, right? Right. Yeah. And people feel like, I think it's true, we are, we're building a community. Mm -hmm. You know, I often say we're teaching the community how to do what it knew how to do 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. Who Definitely. had a baby who was ill, yeah. who was widowed, who needed a hand, and we're, we're creating that mechanism again for our community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, we talked about life becoming more complicated. It's, it seems like now people have to bring their kids 40 places when they mm. used to only have to bring them one That's <laughs> true. or two. That's true. Um, what do you think would make a caregiver's life easier? What are some tips? Number one, and it, and it always sounds a little bit like a cliche, but we were talking about this mm -hmm. earlier, and that is for the caregiver to take care of themselves. But I think before that, there's, there needs to be this recognition that it is, it's a hard job. You know, it can be very sweet and very nice, but it's a very hard job, and I think having people understand that. The other thing that I think can help caregivers, especially those who are employed, is for the workplaces to understand the needs of that caregiver, for flex time, for family medical leave, if that's, if that's appropriate to that organization, okay. um, for coworkers to understand. Very mm -hmm. often the stress in the workplace is among coworkers. Right. So flex time would mean you kind of come in coming in around, late, using around a longer lunch 30, hour. 930. Taking, taking time to take mom to that doctor's appointment. Yep. Yep. Okay, and um, Carolyn, why don't you just mention real quick the Family Medical Leave Act, too. Um, you know, organizations are, are, of course, in position, you know, for 50 employees or more that they're mandated, you know, to provide this benefit mm -hmm. um, that allows people to take a certain amount of time off in consensus with the organization to take care of a family member. And that, of course, can meet a basic need. You know, I okay. think what Diane and I, you know, talk about is something that even goes beyond that. Um, because, you know, if you do the math, there's, you know, that, that person can be accommodated by, you know, changing their hours or being off for a number of weeks to accommodate and um, take care of someone. Mm -hmm. But on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, regardless, you know, of the mandate, you know, really, what can an organization do to step up to the plate right. um, and still meet their business need? Um, you know, I think it actually goes back to remember when, you know, women, you know, wouldn't even be able to consider having child care services, you know, right. on, on, you know, at the level of an organization. You know, that, that has come around and we're able to do that now. Right. I think that it it's really reflects the initiative that has to be in place um, for taking care of, of our um, aging parents. So okay. And just so people understand, mm -hmm. the act 
um, you're not paid during the time, right? You're t it's just you're guaranteed that you have a job when you come back. Again, you know, I'm not the subject expert, you know, on the benefit itself, you know, from the federal government, Neither but am I. <laughs> it, right. Um, but you know, there's language in that that I think is you know protective of someone returning to their job, whether it be the same job or you know another place in the business. Um, but it is you know one of the safety measures. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would like to know a number. And it's probably not measured of how many hours per year are lost as a result of caregiving. From well, somebody's it's, job. it's interesting. MetLife did a study in 2006, and it was a longitudinal study, and they estimated that the cost to American business simply by caregivers in the workplace is $34 billion. There you That's go. people who have to take a leave, people mm -hmm. who decide to work part time people who decide to quit their job, um, mm -hmm. and then some of the informal cost time lost on the job. And um, you know, one of the biggest stress, supervisors lose time when they're supervising mm -hmm. a caregiver if there are misunderstandings or right. tensions, and it, ad it adds up to a considerable amount. Mm -hmm. And we would think that that's an amount that would be better spent educating yes. people about caregiving yeah, and, right. and their health. That's right. Yeah, there was another statistic that I had written here Almost 2 million caregivers are in New York State, providing an estimated 2,000 million, which I guess is 2 billion, hours of caregiving, valued at $20 million a year just in New York State. A lot of people are doing it, and they're doing it long distance. You know, many times when a caregiver maybe is on the phone at work, they're, they're calling out of town. Is this the weekend I need to go? Is somebody going to check on my parents? Can I get the doctor on the phone during my business hours? Those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, there's a, I was just going to mention, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, again, we, we want to make sure that people are connected to those support services and, you know, for just being in the, in the um, arena of the health care for, you know, as long as um, I have and for senior whole health, you know, we try to, again, support that caregiver and in, in, in instill in them uh, some um, guidelines, if you will, in taking care of, you know, their, their aging parents and doing it with respect, you know, in empowering the person, making sure that they include their parents into the decision making as much as possible. You know, all those little, all recommendations right. that someone can take away yes. and also getting help for yourself, even if it's at the point of you need counseling. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to admit to yourself when you need help because being a caregiver, you just take it all on. So you you know you just uh, um, um, you know assume that right. you should know everything there is to be done. I would think it'd be manifested in physical symptoms, whether it's you know you become ill yourself or you lose your temper or you know yeah. something like that. And you that's, don't know that's what's a going sign. On that's right. That's a symptom. And anxiety, that's right. I think are that's too right. big. Yes. We want to try to allow that caregiver to get help before that happens. Okay. One last thing, why is November such a special month for caregiving? <laughs> well, it's this, it is the, this, the national recognition of caregivers and of the, the increase in caregiving, especially in all the ways that it impacts all of us. I mean, one of the things is true, if many people are caregivers now, but it is almost a guarantee that if you are not now, you are going to be. That's right. Mm. So it's good for everybody to learn about caregiving. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about uh, further contact information. How uh, can somebody look up community caregivers? They can find us on the internet uh, at communitycaregivers.org or okay. Google Community Caregivers Albany County and they will find us or call us at 456-2898. Okay. And Carol Ann. And seniorwholehealth.com, yes. one word. Um, and our main number is 472. 5200. Okay. And we have a few other websites to give. Um, the Department for Aging for Albany County, uh, they do a lot of referrals. They right? do. Mm -hmm. they, have a, they have a special bank of uh, staff that will do referrals and have information on lots of resources in Albany County. Okay. So that's albanycounty.com slash aging. And they can be contacted at 447-7177. And lastly, um, the Town of Colony Senior Services as well, uh, colony.org slash seniors, and the phone number 459-5051.
Any other information you guys want to squeeze in before we No, I, end, I think, you know, it's a lot of numbers. Um, yeah. But again, I think it's important for people to realize that there is help out there for them. Yeah. And thank you for helping helping us yes, to get the get word the out. out. And I want to thank you for coming Thanks, in. Thanks, Peggy. Thank you. Thanks for watching. We hope to see you next time on Focus on Health.